If they're not, then they're free goods in them, and they're not part of the supply curve. So, so even though this starts out as an attack on partial equilibrium, the conceptual framework is a general model of the economy where each market is comprised of a supply and demand framework, and that is their own partial equilibrium markets for the entire economy, so the economy is made up of partial equilibrium markets, and that all the factors of production are fully utilized. Because if they weren't, then they wouldn't be part of the analysis in the first place. So, if that's the case, and you have a shift in the demand in one market, supply curves are sloping upward because, remember, we're dealing with diminishing returns. So that gives you an upward sloping supply curve. So if you have a shift in demand, how is this shift in demand going to be able to result in increased quantities produced in that market? Well, the only way to do that is to take inputs from other markets. Remember, they're all fully utilized, so there's none of them hanging around. We don't have any unemployed, underemployed graduate students out there who can be pressed into service. <coughs> Everything is fully utilized. So the only way to increase output is to take resources from other markets. So therefore, you get a discussion about how to conceptualize this kind of issue. And it first says, OK, let's say that if you, in order to increase output here, demand has to increase, which means that in all the other markets, what's much going to have to happen? That word doesn't come into existence until probably 2050. No, <laughs> certainly not 1925. <laughs> 1970s. Ceteris paribus collapses. No, no. What, what happened? How can, if demand increases here, what must be happening in other markets in order to make this thing work? What should decrease? Demand. Demand. Demand has to decrease so it can free up the resources. So each and every other market must have a slight reduction in demand. And when they do so, that will free up resources. Now, as the resources get freed up, so to speak, then this industry has to bid for them. What happens if the resources get freed up in such a way that they are not sufficient to match the increased demand for those resources? What would happen then? Price goes up. The price of those resources increase because you've got to bid for them. And if they're being released but not in a sufficient amount then your bidding for them will drive up the price, which means that what happens? Your supply curve increases because of what? Increased supply price of the inputs, because you have to bid for them. So the increase in the supply curve is due to the rise of factor input price. Now, if that occurs, remember this is a literary argument. It's actually been a, people have, been, have worked out a, a mathematical um, analogy in comparison to, to the other. Um, if the price increases here, as you demand shift, you have to bid for it, the price goes up. And that input in this market, whose price is being bid for, what happens in a market which also uses that input? And the goods in both markets are um, relatable. So price of, uh, of beer and wine. So the price of beer changes what happens with impact upon demand for wine, things like that. <coughs> so 
So, so, so what happens? What's the first outcome? It means that the supply curve in the second market, which uses that input, must shift back because the prices have increased. Okay? So shift back there. What does this mean? <coughs> it means that the price of the good in this market has increased. But since if that increases, it means that it's become relatively more expensive relative to the good here when it was at this point. So what's going to happen to demand in that market? It increases the shifts out demand. Press that. Now, what's going on here? Marsh Schaffer sets up a particular argument. The argument is that if you increase for if, um, if demand shifts outward, then you need more inputs, and it has to be slight decline demand elsewhere to free up those inputs. Those inputs <coughs> don't get freed up in the quantity that is necessary, so you have to bid for them. So the price goes up. Then the supply curve slopes upward, but the increase in the price will make the demand curve, supply curve curve shift backward, which raises the price of this good relative to this one, which means then the demand for this good shifts out. That is collateral impact, which makes <coughs> a difference. That's what Strasser was after. And of course, once this shifts out, then these things shift back again, and we have this ongoing impact. So these markets are not independent of each other. This is a failure of Sitter's Paribus. That's his, that's his first argument. Any questions? It actually doesn't have anything to do with diminishing returns, per, per, per se. Uh, it's really about a price effect. And that's what makes the part, the, sets the economy in a dependence. Yeah, process ever stopped. Well, it doesn't have to worry about whether it ever stops. Once you have this collateral impact, the notion that we have independent markets ceases to exist. So then you, you have to ask different questions then. <coughs> Anyways, after the issue of Sitter's Paribus, it's not an attack on neoclassical theory. It's an attack upon Sitter's Paribus partial equilibrium, which is what most economic theory was done, or how it was undertaken, either then or today. How many people here think you should introduce um, intro micro students to general equilibrium? No, nobody. Do well, it. I, I do it. Well, that's heterodox stuff, not, not your class. But general equilibrium. Two, two equations, two unknown models. That's ninth grade algebra. But the point is that we wouldn't think about it in <coughs> terms of general equilibrium, certainly in the kind of way that would be relevant uh, between two neoclassical. It becomes too complicated. But even worse than that, you probably got it when you're in your second year, right? Did you get general equilibrium in your second year? Not a whole lot. No, well, right. Oh, well. Declining standards in Austria. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, the, um, the, the issue is that general equilibrium is, is very complex, and since everything is done in partial equilibrium, if you actually attack that and create problems with it, then virtually everything that is taught in micro at the inter introductory intermediate level outside of equi general equilibrium has no basis. It doesn't make neoclassical theory wrong, just because this partial equilibrium approach is problematic. So that's the first argument. The second argument is that what happens if you have demand shift out here, we have demand shifts back imperceptibly in every other, all these industries, and they let go of the inputs needed by this one to increase their output, but in greater amounts in which they need them. 
and the pipes on the inputs remain unchanged. So what happens then? Well, we end up with a constant supply curve. The supply curve is based, the increase in the supply curve is based on rising prices, not diminishing returns. So in this case, we have a set of analyst purpose supply curve. We have a supply curve like this, and demand would shift, but have no impact upon prices, so there would be no impact over here. Right? Prices all remain constant. But what's the implication of this? True, but let's not, let's not remember. No, you can't produce them definitely because you're constrained by all oh, oh, these will just be stuff. I mean, be um, set. What determines the price here? Well, the cost of production, supply curve. Independent of demand, right? So you shift demand all you want, no change in price. So supply and demand don't work. The way it's conventionally thought, and it's really the classical notion of the cost of production which determines the price, which is a different kind of animal than your conventional frame, your conventional argument. But supply and demand do not interact to determine price and quantity. That's also not a good position. And so we're not, we're not getting too far here. One of them is that partial equilibrium creates a problem, or we have a problem with partial equilibrium. Um, when we get away from that, so we don't have any change in prices, we have a horizontal supply curve, which creates another set of problems. Then he says, oh, what happens if we go to increasing returns to scale? And this is fairly conventional. Is that if you have increasing returns, well, there's two things. You have external economy. What's the problem with external economies? Marshall loved external economies. The problem with external economies is that set of curves doesn't remain fixed. By definition, as something happens, other in industries, other markets become involved. That's what external economies are all about. It impacts, as you expand output in one market, that it has impacts on other markets to lower the price, save your inputs. That's not Sutter's parable. Sutter's parable is that something has in that market and has no impact on anything else. Because when it does, then you have a much more interdependent economy. So external economies disrupts um, the notion of Sutter's parable. The um, if you have internal economies, then we just simply lead to monopoly. Again, that's not Marshall's, but that's the argument that now is, it, is there because the enterprise under Schraffa and subsequently is not the representative firm in which the size of that firm is determined by clogs to clogs and three generations, by managerial capability. That there's an inherent constraint within the enterprise. That's not what they have here. There's nothing like Marshall's argument. But it's a much more kind of a modern one. So, so we have a real problem. We either violate Sutter's paribus, or we have a horizontal supply curve, which means that demand is not known with determined prices, or it leads to monopoly. <coughs> How the hell are you going to get out of this? The answer is that you can get an upward sloping supply curve, which doesn't have all these impacts, if that supply curve or that market is the sole use of the input. And in that case, the input rise in prices and use more of it intensely only has an impact upon its own supply curve. 
So you have to come up with a scenario in which that input is its um, is solely used in that market. Although Schraffer didn't talk about it, but subsequent developments made it clear is that not only must it only be used in that market, it must not, it must not be the output of that market. That is, corn is used as seed as an input to produce corn as an output. That would be an input that is produced within the market. If that's the case, then we have all kinds of problems. So it has to be very specific. A factor input in which it's solely used in a single market, so if you use it more intensely, the price goes up. That was one way of doing it. The other possibility that Schraffer came up with is that you could get This kind of U-shaped average sort of cost curve, where you end up at diminishing returns, if it's predicated on something which is internal to the industry, but external to the other product. Talk about that kind of possibility. More developed by, uh, more referred to by Hicks in 1939. <coughs> so, so where does this lead us? Where it leads us in terms of understanding the theory is that the, the partial equilibrium supply and demand analysis under competitive conditions in the long period, because it has nothing to say about short period, um, is incoherent except on the very restrictive assumption. What is incoherent about it is, is that either <coughs> demand and um, price is unrelated to demand, or that you end up in monopoly, or that's most importantly setter's pair of risk preference hold. Many people who talk about this stuff rarely actually think about the implication of the notion of setter's pair of risk. Because if you can show that setter's pair of risk is violated under any number of different kinds of conditions, then the partial equilibrium which has been using to talk about, say, factor input demand functions ceases to exist. You can't talk about the issues of an individual market, which means virtually all of micro that we teach or you've learned is incoherent. If you're going to play the game correctly, Shafa suggested one of two alternatives. One of them is you go to general equilibrium. Remember, this is not an attack upon neoclassical theory per se. It's an attack on the notion of setters perverse and the use of partial equilibrium in talking about supply and demand. So you go to general equilibrium. Shafa is perfectly fine. Yeah, go to general equilibrium. I think it's it's um it's of little interest impractical and everything else, but you could go there and you would escape the entire critique of, of the level of partial equilibrium. The other one was that if you, if you want to stay in partial equilibrium, so to speak, and we have, and we can't really use this kind of competitive framework and we want to somehow reestablish some kind of relation between price and cost. I'm um, sorry, demand and cost. Isn't that what a supply and demand curve is all about? The intersection of demand and cost, or demand and supply. Then you go towards monopoly. And the monopoly, there is always an interaction between what we would now call marginal cost and marginal revenue, but price and cost to determine output. And so what he suggests, and I'm not going to go through all of it, is that he suggests moving towards monopoly. Now, 
uh, the, it is necessary, therefore, to abandon the path of free competition. I use perfect competition in my notes, but Schrafer uses free competition. That's what should be used in my notes. Perfect competition doesn't come out, like I say, until around 1930, 1929, or something like that. Okay. And turn in the opposite direction, namely towards monopoly. Here we find a well-defined theory in which variations of cost connected with changes in the dimensions of the individual undertaking play an important part. Important part. So he wants to go towards monopoly. Then he makes a whole set of suggestions. <laughs> if you go towards monopoly, what does this mean? What some of the issues involved, etc. Uh, and this has a couple of interesting points. First of all, he doesn't say monopoly, so he's not talking about monopoly. He's talking about going towards monopoly. To go towards <coughs> monopoly. What has to happen? Now, the issues that we face here is that, for Marshall, there is no demand curve facing the firm. The representative firm does not face a demand curve. That line where the price is drawn is simply a price line. It's not a demand curve. Now, later on, you will start having that line identified as a demand curve, and that comes somewhere in late. But for Marsh, but the stuff is that for Marshall, the individual firm did not face the main curve. Now monopolist does, but a monopolist is a special case, which we'll eventually get to. So how are you going to deal with this issue of going towards monopoly, where an enterprise, in a sense, has some kind of definable markets or sales? where it relates cost to demand in some sense, et cetera. What are you going to have to do? What you have to do is give the individual firm a demand curve. Now, what you have up until this time are arguments of monopoly, which firms have a demand curve. When you went to duopoly, they made all kinds of particular assumptions, very ad hoc assumptions, and perhaps sometimes <coughs> They give a firm a demand curve, um, other times didn't. Um, there's a whole range of literature on this from 1900 to 1930, 1925, which is very interesting um, because it's not the way we see it today. What Schraffer does suggest, makes it very clear, is that he gives a firm a demand curve, not a monopolist. So we have something in between perfect comp or um, free competition and monopoly, and that entity now is being associated with a demand curve for its own. Um, let's see now. Is that uh, this necessity of reducing prices in order to sell a larger quantity of one's own product is, o is only an aspect of the usual descending demand curve, with the differences that instead of concerning the whole of the commodity, whatever its origin, it relates only to the goods produced by a particular firm. And the marketing expenses necessary, necessary for the extension of its markets are merely costly efforts to increase the willingness of markets to buy from it, that is, to raise the demand curve artificially. That simple statement is, in fact, one of the most revolutionary statements made because it gives a firm a demand curve, which had never existed before. Now, he also says that marketing can increase demand. That creates all kinds of issues in its own, in its own right. Now, we are clearly saying that demand is not autonomously given from a range of individuals out there, right? It's being created. I don't know how do you deal with that. So how do you reconcile individual demand curves or market demand curves? based on individuals, and these demand curves facing enterprises. Now, these are all kinds of issues which we'll have to deal with. And economists at the time tried to deal with them. Um, marketing costs create such hassle that they eventually eliminate it and assume it as a fixed cost, as opposed to a variable cost or a marginal cost. But you can read um, people like Herod to find out about that. So. Marshall made, I mean, sorry, Schraffer made suggestions about how to go forward. 
people that were most influenced by this was the Cambridge people, lots of people, Roy Harris, Marshall, General, Cambridge, would be the ones that one would look back today. They would be the most influenced by this. Uh, but there were others. Edward Chamberlain comes at this. They wrote monopolistic competition at the same time. Comes at it through a different kind of route, not necessarily spurred on by um, traffic, but concerned with similar kinds of issues. The whole point is that if you're not going to deal with a competitive framework or a monopoly, you think that there are things in between, how do you construct an analytical framework to deal with it? And that's what we call the imperfect competition revolution. How does one, it's about constructing this intermediary framework. While we can talk more about it, let's, let's just defer that except for the fact that um, in many ways that imperfect competition framework um, has been rejected by economists today. But we'll, we can come back to that. Now, if you have a firm with its own demand curve, then what else might you have associated with What? Is it, is it, no, no, don't think about it. The, the firm has its own demand curve. What else could be associated with this? The firm had its own, well, what kind of revenue? Marginal. marginal revenue. You have your demand curve, you get marginal revenue. Just like you have in your total cost curve, what do you get? Marginal cost, right? So. Marginal revenue um, curve becomes developed. Now, we shall see when we talk about monopoly that Marshall had already identified the marginal revenue curve. He just called the thing we were looking for, which, which we'll get to. And he dealt with monopoly. What's the problem with monopoly? Monopoly is irrelevant for theory. It's simply the alternative extreme to a competitive framework. So it holds up that particular um, relational setup. So if you have a competitive framework, what's the opposite of it is monopoly. You can then compare, make comparisons between the two. But it's not important for important theorizing with under a competitive framework. So no matter what you do in a monopoly, it doesn't generalize. It's specific to monopoly. What happens here? When you start giving firms their individual demand curve, then you've made a role for marginal revenue, which is now generalizable across competitive and imperfectly competitive scenarios. So then it becomes important, and we'll, and we'll talk about it. The um, interesting aspect is that the marginal revenue curve gets christened marginal revenue by uh, Austin <coughs> Robinson, John Robinson's husband, because some potsy little old physics major decides to take some economics classes. And when coming to deal with this stuff, he plays around with the mathematics because it's trivial. And poor Joan Robinson, who probably had a hard time, not entirely, but adding numbers together. But she had no mathematical background to the extent. Um, found it very interesting, very interesting tool. But she never would have seen it herself. Um, so it's an interesting story, but it means that marginal revenue, the way we understand it today and how it's used, was invented in 1928. Even though it can be found in Marshall, whatever, as our analytical tool, 1928. So it's less than 100 years old. And when I started doing these things 30 years ago, I could say that it was even much younger than that. Now, um, just one other point before we start into the perfectly competitive theory of crisis is that we're at a juncture here. We have a concept which we draw in from Marshall 
which are now being <coughs> progressively dropped. One of the most important ones is a representative firm. Um, your readings and this, my notes will talk about it. But the representative firm gets replaced with the equilibrium firm. And the issue here is that Marshall's representative firm be difficult to say it was an e equilibrium, but I mean, you say that. But no other firm in Marshall was an e in equilibrium. So you had a framework of analyzing how markets work in a supply and demand framework in which individual enterprises actually were not in equilibrium. This is equivalent to constructing heterogeneity in the system. So if you want to talk about markets being in equilibrium, how is it possible to talk about that if the individual Enterprises are not in equilibrium. So what um, Zhu does, and others follow him, is talk about the equilibrium firm and then make that firm identical to all firms in the market, and presto, he has the entire market in equilibrium. That's a particular role of the equilibrium firm. But that's something which has to come out. If you're going to talk about um, and the competitive conditions of a bunch of different enterprises, and you talk about market equilibrium, you have to make sure that everybody's in equilibrium. Makes it very difficult if they happen to be different. Well, and, 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 we'll, and we'll talk about this. Remember, this is all in the context of long period. If you start thinking about short period, you're going to be thrown off. This is all long period thinking at this point. So we dropped the representative firm and a couple of other things that, that show up this time. But we have a transition. While this transition is seen in the writings of Herod, for example, he's an example um, of trying to grasp what it means to go towards monopoly, but not be in a monopoly. You have to think about how does one construct an individual demand curve. So you read Herod, either now or you read him when you get your imperfect competition, about how we think about constructing an individual demand curve. You have this general market, you somehow have to fracture that general market demand curve to make things and have individual demand curves associated with this individual enterprise. So the reading is convoluted, but you can see the issues which are at stake. They're trying to create something which, in a sense, didn't really exist. Is that the same Harrow's as like the Harrow's Dillmore model? Is that, is that the same? I don't even know. <coughs> Harrow's Dillmore model. Macro growth. Yet, yet, this is provoked <laughs> this particular class. That's Herod of 1939. Now, now, we have to know we have to know our uh, theater, but not our macro, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's just say that um, um it's, it's the same one. Um, there's actually a train of thought that leads Herod from doing this work to this work to by Keynes. That's a story for another class. Okay. So what we're going to do now is jump ahead, so to speak, and deal with perfect competition. Assuming that all the stuff that takes place in the 20s and 30s as you put perfect competition into place and refine it has all been taking place and we're simply going to look at it. The perfect uh, competition theory of prices under partial equilibrium. Oh, by the way, I forgot. Schrafer, um suggested going towards monopoly. Didn't particularly like perfect. Didn't like general equilibrium. Um, what in fact he did do shortly thereafter, in making those comments, he simply said, "Let's deal with a world in which there's no supply and demand in the first place." And that culminates in the production of production of commodities by means of commodities in 1960. So we have a framework about analyzing prices in which supply and demand are absent. So we're in a different world altogether. It took the rest of Cambridge 30 years to catch up. Now, perfect, uh, perfectly competitive theory of prices. Now, why do we want to do this? Because we know that it's nonsense in any kind of substantive way. So why do we want to do it? Well, the objective of economists who developed this perfectly competitive theory of prices 
was to rescue economic theory, that is, the economic theory that deals with the allocation of scarce resources among competing ends in the clutches of imperfect competition. And the punchline of imperfect competition, which we'll come back to because we'll all forget about it, is that an imperfect competition is no supply curve. Henceforth, prices don't reflect, are not in the scarcity in indexes and a whole bunch of other things. That's what imperfect competition does. And that's what Marshall, that's what Schrapp and others were pushing people towards, pushing them towards imperfect competition, where in fact virtually all the properties of perfectly, of, of what we'll call a competitive market do not exist. So, as some guy named Hicks said, it has to be recognized that a general abandonment of the assumption of perfect competition, now it's clearly being used now, a universal assumption of monopoly must have very destructive consequences for economic theory. Therefore, let's, let's try to make, let's tr try not to go down that path and go down a perfectly competitive path. So let's see if we can articulate perfect competition and get away from this stuff. That would destroy virtually everything we know about economic theory. So, the moral story is, is that the emergence of perfect competition, uh, in some sense, is to rescue economic theory from the clutches of um, a world in which supply and demand doesn't operate, and there's no price or not indexes of scarcity, and that just leads on to all other kinds of terrible things, uh, uh, maybe, maybe even government intervention in the economy. Keynes was one or something. So clearly, the system cannot be thought to work in such a way that everything is optimal. Because with no supply curve, can you have any optimality? Well, okay, great optimality is gone, so markets can't be thought to have worked. Well, what does that lead you to? Well, massive unemployment, Great Depression, and clearly government intervention. And Hicks, among others, simply at this time, <coughs> we're highly <coughs> um, skeptical of any kind of government intervention or, cons or um, attacks on the market. That's how they use, I mean, that's how what Strauss and that by that free competition, like free of any government intervention. Well, free competition, it, it's, yeah, there's no government intervention, but um, the term free competition is used by Marshall. Marshall gave them particular arguments for it. You have kind of a freedom of entry and exit. But you also have goodwill. So markets get divided up in a particular way while people become attached. Well, perfect competition eliminates that. So free competition is one way, has most of the properties of perfect competition, but not all of them. The notion of goodwill is being reserved as a way to construct downward sloping demand curves. Marshall never thought in those terms, um, but that, that's how John Robinson and others articulated it. So free competition becomes different. I mean, really different in this kind of context. Okay, what are the assumptions of perfect competition? I assume everybody knows the assumption, right? No, that's not an assumption. That's an outcome of a particular case. What, what can we talk about our assumptions? Well, first two assumptions. All firms sell goods that are identical with respect to the physical characteristics, location, and time of availability. Very specific here. A good is defined in terms of its physical characteristics, location, and time. Therefore, if the time variable is different, the goods are different. Which means what? What? No. It sounds like short period. Well, goods in the short period are different from goods in the long period. They can be physically the same, but because of the time, Things are very different. Location. If they're located, if an iPad is located in Pakistan and another one is located in, oh, I mean, in Delhi, they are different. Location of their transactions are different, and therefore the goods are different. Now, you may not think they're different, but that's the way the theory is set up. Most people don't pay much attention to location differences, but um, that's, that's just being precise. 
and of course their physical characteristics. Okay. So we're dealing with partial equilibrium, perfectly competitive state of the price. So the market and the partial equilibrium, um, the goods in that market are identical. Okay. Second one, consumers in that market, the competitive market, are identical from the firm, from the seller's point of view, in that there are no advantages or disadvantages associated with selling to a, partic to a particular consumer, which means that consumers are randomly related to the sellers. Buyers and sellers have a random relationship. Because if they had martial goodwill, so they get attached to, the buyers and sellers get attached to each other, then from this perspective, that generates an issue of monopoly and then hence creates a downward slope in the demand curve. Even though Marshall never thought in those terms. Uh, well that's how they're thinking about it. So you can't have any goodwill. Buyers and sellers are randomly related. Now, that means when I talk to my business students, if you, if you take this on board, then all you who are doing market, marketing have no existence in this world. The whole point about marketing is to make people get attached to products. Here they're randomly, just randomly related. So come back. So why do we want to deal with a framework which has no bearing at all to the world that we live in? Remember, this is general. It's not just from one or two markets. We're talking about a general economy, which this is this is pervasive. So there's obviously something more than trying to actually explain the world going on here. Okay. Now, the outcome of this is that consumers had no interest in buying the same product and, um, at a higher price. Right? So they can go to another um, seller and get it at a lower price. So they had the driving force of ensuring that all the sellers charge the same price, and of course, the sellers from their side are willing to sell to consumers who would buy it at a higher price. Um, so there's pressures on both sides to end up with a single price. So there can't be any price differentials within the framework. Okay. Another way of saying it is that this um, two sets of assumptions ensure that we're going to end up with a horizontal demand curve being faced faced by the individual enterprise. The price is, is beyond their capabilities of control. The third assumption is that, it has a couple of parts, that both firms and consumers are numerous and, and the sales or purchases uh, of each unit is small relative to the aggregate whole. So <coughs> individual enterprises are numerous, but that's not sufficient. You have lots and lots of enterprises out there. One of them controls 95% of the market, all the rest of them control some fraction thereof. So you just can't say they're numerous. You have to also say that their um, selling of output is simply a very small part of the aggregate whole. Small enough so it can have no impact upon the price on which it's being sold at the market. And of course, the same thing for the buyers. The buyers must be numerous and their purchases must be small relative to the aggregate sales in the market. That basically means that all of them have no power in the market. So this is a mechanism to ensure that they are powerless to have an impact on the overall market price of quantity, and particularly the market price. If any one individual enterprise raised its price, um, the other ones wouldn't, and in fact, therefore, would have to be treated, and therefore, had no impact. If you're big enough, you could raise your price. The other ones might have a problem, um, but it would certainly have an overall impact on, on the market. So again, it's a way to ensure that everybody is powerless within the framework, so they can't exert any impact upon market outcomes. The fourth assumption is perfect information about prevailing price and current bids and 
capabilities of taking advantage of all, po all, all possibilities. Perfect, uh, perfect information. Now, this particular concept, perfect information, in fact, has no meaning. Um, what do you define? What do you, how can you articulate perfect information? I am God. Well, that means it's undefined. Right. <laughs> now, the problem is that whatever information you might have um, can ha actually generate an impact upon what kind of information others might need to have. <coughs> this is a kind of Hayekian kind of problem of how one would even define a conception of perfect information. The, the issue here um, can be thought of in another way. You need to know information about all prevailing prices and current prices. In fact, you also have to, um, this would be extended to having complete information about all future possible prices. But what future possible prices or current possible prices are, as far as possibilities, is dependent upon how others are thinking about what are current um, prices. So if people have disagreements about what are current prices, and that disagreement generates new ideas about what current prices may be, or possibly may be, then what do we mean by perfect information? How do we know that we've got information sufficient that um, it's, we can call it perfect or complete? It becomes very difficult. Uh, so, but the assumption is there to simply say that if somebody's getting a better deal than me, I know about it immediately which means that nobody can get a better deal. That's more or less what it comes down to. But they couch it in terms of perfect, perfect information. Finally, the fifth assumption is that there's freedom of entry and exit in the market in the long period. Fairly standard notion. Those five assumptions characterize what we call a perfectly competitive market. A perfectly competitive market is not an empirical phenomenon, it's an axiomally defined phenomenon. And if those axioms are not adhered to, the market seems to be perfectly competitive. So what we end up having for the rest of the 20th century and into the 21st century is defined non-perfectly competitive markets in a way that supposedly violates one of the assumptions. <coughs> now, people are actually trying to get around it by introducing new axioms, but, um, but that's what it is. So imperfect competition, which we're dealing with, it simply violates or sets aside a particular assumption or set of assumptions that define a perfectly competitive market. It's an analytical device, not something driven by the real world. So everything that we're going to talk about is under the context of these set of assumptions which characterize a perfectly competitive market. Now, at this point, we can now talk about short period in the market and long period. So we've set everything up. And of course, we have to do it in two ways. We have to talk about firm equilibrium in the market. And then we've got to talk about market equilibrium, both in the short period and long period. <coughs> so, Drew, what's Iowa doing? 38, 31. Okay. <laughs> you should have seen him baking on his hands and knees for me to cancel class today. Oh. One out of two, that's better than KU uh, shooting. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, hell, anybody would be better than KU shooting in the last three and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so up here at the prices. And we'll start with the firm. So what do we do? Well, what do we always do in this? We set up a kind of a constraint system where we have revenues on one side, costs on the other side, and figure out an algorithm that enables you to, so the prices are given in, for the firm in a short period of the perfect competition, enable you to select an output that will maximize price, profit. It's fairly straightforward. So, we can have profit as pi, that's equal to py times y minus, since it's a short period, um, <coughs> p1, x1, and e, we're just going to assume two inputs so I don't have to write everything out, plus p2, x2, Everybody comfortable with this? So what do you do? <coughs> Please don't make me cry. What do we do to the next step? First order condition. Well, we just said differentiate to get we can get our, uh, our, our first order condition. But yes, I think you do. My God, come on, we're talking about calculus. <laughs> so you change pi with respect to change in what? Y. Y. Now, before we go any further, how does one think about how markets work? What's the kind of story that is given? Well, let me ask you this. You have a demand curve. How do you ex talk about the demand curve? It's not a loaded question. Are you going to move this along the curve? Yeah, but what's moving? What's moving? Price. You change the price, you see what happens to quantity and demand, right? change the price. We're doing a supply curve. We talk about an increase in the supply price, right? What have we done here? What's being changed? What? Output. Output. Is that how you just talked about your supply and demand curves? No, you're talking about a change of prices. Okay. Be careful what you do here. Marshall does it in terms of changes in output. And virtually all of this comes from a Mar Marshall's influence. If you think in terms of change in prices, which they like to do in high theory, that's Malraisian. Because an auctioneer will stand out there to change the price, and we'll see what quantities are supply and demand. But that's not how Marshall does it. So the way we've set up here is in a sense, a continuation of Marshall thinking where you change output and then you see what happens. It makes no difference to the outcome whether you, you output as independent variable or the price. It just matters what tradition you're coming from. Um, and many people simply use it um, mixture, but those who try to be precise and think of price as independent variable because that's what gets changed and things react to the change in price um, we come from a well, well raising approach, and it looks different, so to speak. When you look at the appendix of the chapter, you will see the difference in how it looks, uh, but it doesn't change anything. So I just wanted to let you know that um, we're actually looking at it from a Marshallian kind of approach. Now, if we differentiate it, then what do we get? Well. This is given, right? The price is given. Assuming that you've had some intermediate micro, you know that you don't have to establish every single point. So that's equal to what? 
dy minus change in x1 e with respect to change in one with respect to change in y. Right? Now we know that p1 is given, that all prices are given. So to say to put this in equilibrium, so to speak, we would simply rewrite it as py is equal to change of p1, which is equal to what? What's it equal to? What's it equal to? Marginal cost. Marginal cost, okay. We can put marginal cost, but we'll probably want to define marginal cost. <coughs> What's that equal to? The first thing we have to realize is that if we're going to explain things here, Marginal cost doesn't do it. You have to see what marginal cost is made up, that is, its components, and then explain things in terms of its components. <coughs> so the answer of marginal cost doesn't get us very far because it doesn't tell me anything about what is actually going on here. Well, I've already actually done this, so it's, that's the reason I'm a bit concerned that you haven't followed your theory of production and cost stuff. This stuff should be part of your dreaming every night. Look at this right there. What's that? Well, if I did the following. There's no production function, right? A change in y with respect to change in x. I would equal what? Marginal product, right? That's, that's what a marginal product is. <coughs> okay. And we know that if we're in the realm of stage two of production, what direction is that marginal product moving? Uh, downward sloping. You know, just because it was a break didn't mean you actually thought you could get away with not looking at this stuff. Okay, so. So what's this then? Supposed to say the marginal product upside down. Right? Yeah. If this is the marginal product, then that is the marginal product upside down. Or it can be rewritten as P1 over the marginal product. Right? So what is this equal to? And you can say marginal cost, but what I really want you to get to is that it's equal to the price over the marginal product. So what happens as you produce more? What's going to happen? What's going to happen to your marginal cost when you produce more? Speak up. It's going to increase because the marginal product declines, right? We just said stage two, tiny marginal product. So as you produce more, the marginal product declines. This remains constant. What happens to marginal cost? 